Hi friends, this is John and this is the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast, where we talk about agronomic science and cultural management practices and all the fun pieces that are needed for us to really regenerate plant health and soil health and ultimately, of course, human health. On this episode, I'm really excited to be having a conversation with Austin Alred. Austin has several stories that I've found really intriguing when I first met him at a conference some time ago. Uh, Austin, thank you for being here. Thank you for being willing to share. And I'm not, uh, I'm not going to even attempt to introduce your background and uh, some of the fascinating things that you've done. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the context of your, your farming operation and uh, what your journey has been like for the last couple of decades? Thanks, John. I'm excited to be here. I've used, I've used a lot of your past visitors as inspiration for a lot of the stuff we're doing in our regenerative endeavors. But a little background, I've, we are in the Columbia Basin of Washington State, which is sitting right in the middle of the state. It's one of the really fertile areas, and we have what we call the Columbia Basin Project, which is Grand Coulee Dam and an irrigation system that really supports our high desert. We get eight inches of rain rain total total rainfall a year so we're nothing without that project but we are a very robust and incredible agriculture area a diversified agriculture area with that excess of water so my my parents started farming geez 50 50 years ago in this area my grandparents actually started before that and they were the first generation here that's when the project came in so based on a GI bill. If you're a veteran, you could come in, get put in a drawing and, and get your land. So they both got some land about 20 miles away from where my parents started. And uh, my dad started first and foremost as a potato farmer. And then as apples have flooded this region in the early 2000s, late 90s. And so he started putting apples in the corner of his, of his, of his irrigation pivots just to kind of keep the soil active and to be able to irrigate so it didn't blow away. And then uh, as I graduated school, so about um, 15 years ago, was when we really, I mean, not that before we didn't, but 15 years ago is when we really decided, like, we need to become self-sufficient. We need to reduce our dependency on the synthetic fertilizers and the stuff that we don't really have a stable pulse on. And that's when we decided we needed ruminants. We needed cattle. And so that started the Royal Dairy Farm. And I started that piece. My brother does the potatoes. I got another brother doing the apples. And we all work together to try to symbiotically flow through. And that's really what we'll be talking about a lot today is those regenerative practices that we've tried to put together between this diverse farm in order to do it sustainably and independently of a lot of the synthetics that we want to have a better pulse on. This is such an interesting um, perspective because I can't think of a single other operation that I know of, and I know of many, who have high-value fruit or vegetable crops and a dairy. Like those, those are two uh, are commonly considered somewhat mutually exclusive. And many times when I have conversations with growers about um, the value that livestock could bring to their operation, it's the common refrain is that well, it's it's too difficult to lift from a labor perspective, from, from all types of, from a management perspective, there is, there are too many other priorities that, um, that get center stage and livestock are just not a fit. What has that been like for your operation? What, what was, how was the lift and what was needed to bring livestock into the operation and turn them into a success? Yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of a big family. And uh, my dad had a lot of kids. And so we are, we all pretty much have our lane. So it was a huge lift for me, <laughs> but they kind of just kept doing business as usual as I started the dairy farm. And now we do a ton of beef and high density grazing for our beef cattle. And so it was very difficult for me, but as, as I've developed that, then we've developed together. Austin, can you give us a bit of a sense of the scale that you're operating on? Yeah, so the potato, portion, which I, I say the potato portion, but in reality, it's majority grass, alfalfa, a little bit of corn for the cattle because the rotation is like potatoes once every five years. So 
The potato portion is about 15,000 acres of irrigated ground. And so of that, every year there's 3,500 acres of potatoes. The rest of it is rotating crops for the cattle. We milk about 10,000 cows. And we have about 8,000 now beef on dairy crosses that we're rotating in those pasture grounds. So when you consider making the shift and in, in incorporating the livestock into the operation 15 years ago, how, how successful were you in uh, removing the need for fertilizers and how did that influence the whole rest of your operation? How did the rest of your operation evolve as a result of that decision? 10, 15 years ago was our, was our real intentional shift to trying to be more regenerative and trying to be more independent. And it has made a huge impact on our focus to where today our focus really is we take care of soil, we take care of cattle, we take care of worms, and naturally we get high quality produce, high quality fruit, and high quality proteins. And that's all evolved in the last 10 years, and we really do try to keep that as our mindset. Our byproducts are what we're selling. Our focus is healthy, natural animals and soil. And so as we as we went towards that, and the obvious, the manure, and the, the massive flexibility that we have because of all these ruminants that we're feeding on our cover crops in our cocktail, you know, strategies when we're making cover crops is just wide open because, again, the vast majority of our growing is growing for our, our protein production. It's growing to feed healthy cattle. So it's just, it's done so much for our advancement in these regenerative practices. So to answer your question directly, John, like our phosphorus and potassium, we're able to grow um, independent with our phosphorus and potassium. We, the ruminants in our systems, really, we've closed the loop on the PNK. We can't say that we've done that for nitrogen yet. We're still in the process and we have some things we can talk about that we're trying to do in order to increase our overall nutrient balance on this operation in the in the end category. When you say you've balanced out uh, or you're you're cycling all of the P and K that you need in your operation, are you bringing in any feed? Is there any is there any P and K coming? Are there any nutrients coming in as feed? Correct. So one of the biggest advantages we have in order to do this at a scale is we bring in most of the coal potatoes from the whole region. And we have two different canneries. So sweet corn, carrots, peppers, even a little bit of onions. So we bring in all this byproduct into the system, into our ecosystem, which is going to start with the ruminant. So we bring in all these nutrients from neighboring farms in the form of byproducts the stuff that humans don't want and that is what allows us to kind of reach our nutrient balance it's a beautiful cycle that is interesting so are, are you bringing in these byproducts in as a livestock feed for some of the things you mentioned i could imagine that being a possibility but you mentioned onions as well and that raised a question mark in my mind we have heifers <laughs> pregnant heifers <laughs> so yes almost i would say 90% of what we bring in is going to start in our kitchen and be livestock feed. And then we have a very robust composting system, which will take the other 10%, and all these are rough numbers, the other 10% of these byproducts that won't quite make grade. And then we have, as I'm sure we'll talk about, the biggest worm farm in the world too, which is going to take any of the waste that's not solid, and the worms will we'll turn that into something first. Yeah, let's let's talk about the worms. I mean, we've we've already opened a couple of rabbit holes that I want to go down. But uh, you mentioned in a sentence a bit ago that you manage livestock, you manage soil health, and you're managing earthworms, and you you singled out worms. And so I I knew this had to lead somewhere. How are you managing earthworms? How are you farming earthworms? So if anybody handles livestock in a large scale. They know solid manure is welcome. It's easy to handle. We compost 100% of our solid manure and we have a robust composting system with, but it's great. 
it, it economically it works even if you have to take that manure like in our situation we'll have some of it's going 10 miles away to some of our far out fields so it works liquid manure is a pain in the ass <laughs> and yes it's got fertilizer in it but you can't do it economically as far as uh stank and ghg emissions it's where the majority comes from so our liquid manure has always been a hassle it's a hassle for any large-scale cattle operator and so we put in about eight acres of long skinny they look like swimming pools but that's just the shape of them with drains in the bottom and the bottom foot and a half is rock and the top three and a half feet is wood chips which comes from our orchards because retired apple trees are harder to chip they don't go to they don't go make paper they get burned and so we're able to make a market for those so you got rock and wood chips which is really copying god's creation and we put the dirty water on top it flows through the wood chips which sorry which is full of the worms which is inoculated with over 50 million worms and so the dirty water settles through the layers of organic matter the layer of mineral and we collect that water off the bottom and now that water is clean enough for us to reuse in our systems or for us to irrigate with simply, ears easily. And then we're left with worms that are now upcycling those wood chips plus that water into solids, which is what we want, but into microbial rich solids. You know, worms will take one microbial and turn it into seven. So it's a whole beautiful system that started with we need clean water because it's it doesn't work. And we need solids. So they do that. But in the process of doing that, they give us 5x microbials on our farm. Wow. All right. So let's talk about this and what is needed, what, what you have learned about this system and what is needed for it to be a success. How did you turn the system over? I've got so many questions. I scarcely know where to begin. Let's start by asking the question, what does the wastewater that comes out of the system look like? Or is there water that comes out of the system? Yeah, so we're, we're putting 300,000 plus gallons of water a day. So call it green water is what's going in on top. And it's, it's coffee. It's nasty. It's shit water. It's the water that, you know, everyone hates. And then as it takes about four hours, as it settles through, we call it tea water off the bottom, which in our regenerative world, it's not exactly accurate, but it's called tea water because of the color. It has no solids. The total suspended solids is almost completely eliminated. It's got a little bit, but it's taken a 90% decrease in the TSS. It's taken an 80% decrease in the nitrogen as it goes through, 70% decrease in the phosphorus, and a 60% decrease in the potassium as this water flows through. And so it still has a T color at the bottom because of the tannings of the wood. It goes through our drip system for our orchard, but it's a tea water that has a little bit of microbial in it it has a little bit of phosphorus a little bit of potassium just a tiny bit of nitrogen and we use it just like irrigation water that was going to be my question is where do you use that for you're using that to irrigate the apple trees through a drip irrigation system yeah a portion of it some of it will go through our circles and then um, most of it actually we're just reusing back through our flush barns and we reuse it to clean all of our systems the only potable water we use on our livestock operation is what the FDA requires us to use in the parlor and then also what the cows drink. What does the application process look like for transferring the slurry water from the, the wash down to the top of the wood chips? Is it sprinkled on through a sprinkler system? What does that application look like? Yeah, so it used to be PVC pipes sitting on top of this these beds. As of two weeks ago, we just installed a linear pivot. So, you know, is that... Is that visualize so it's a it's a over top sprinkler system on wheels that travels through it's it's been infinitely better and better because you get better distribution correct what does the cycle look like for turning over the beds how how frequently do you remove the dry material uh, do you leave any behind as an inoculant for the next batch what does that process look like so on average let's say 18 months so we put clean wood chips in we inoculate it with the worms. It filters millions and millions of gallons over 18 months. We will then take a long arm excavator, which is why they're set up in long skinny swimming pool type beds, and we will clean out those wood chips. 
we'll clean out almost all of them, but the worms are really cool. They're going to put their castings up and they're going to go down. So at the end of the day, if, at, if we're harvesting at a year or two years, it doesn't make all that much difference as long as we just take out the wood chips which have been processed that has more worm castings in it. And as soon as we get to the point where the wood chips are still pretty unprocessed, we just won't go any deeper. That's interesting. So you're actually finding that the wood, the wood chips are processing faster, closer to the surface than they are further, further down. Yeah, and, and to be fair, we've, we've always harvested all the wood chips. The idea is, and we've seen some spaces where we didn't need to, but generally speaking, at some point when you're getting in there, we've just pretty much harvested all the wood chips. And we've only done this twice. Like we've only had the system for three years. So now you have a, um, for, the, for the wood chips, when, when you remove this material, this, this smallish material, what proportion of the wood chips are still recognizable as wood chips? Or I guess my question is, how thoroughly has this been composted? How thoroughly has it been turned into rich black friable material that no longer resembles wood chips at all? Yeah, so we, what we do with it, we take this substrate, which is what we call it, sticky, wet, right out of these beds, and we'll put them in big in, in, in windrows. Uh, we don't want them to heat up, but usually at this point, there's not enough activity in there for them to heat up. There's a little bit of heat that takes place. Sometimes we try to mitigate that because we don't want to kill all the bacteria. But at the end of the day, we'll put them in these big windrows. We will dry them out for a few months, and then when we screen them, we're probably left with about 25% overs and 75% unders, which the unders is a beautiful, most of that's gonna be worm castings. It's a beautiful product. The overs is, you know, wood chippy and yeah. And you can probably reuse that for the cycle again. Correct. How are you using the, the worm castings and the final result of that? I mean, it seems to me that that would be a fairly high value material, not just from a nutrient content perspective but most especially from a microbial activity perspective 100 percent, yeah from like a macro and P and K, it's pretty similar to compost maybe a little bit better but from a micro microbial it's awesome and we right now we use it just pretty raw we put it out on our fields and mostly in our orchards locally well i say locally internally in the last three months and moving forward for the next seven months, we have some massive plans to go next level in this. Because to be straight, we want a clean water and that's what we accomplished for the last three, four years. We realized in that process, oh shit, this is awesome. We have we have worms and microbials and this this is exactly what we need. And so we just started harvesting it raw, putting it in our orchard and we've seen great results. Totally anecdotal. There's not a science bone in my body, but we've since then we get together, we've got people hired and we're now taking it to where just last week we sold some to reclamation project where they're mining. We sold some to the department of ecology to where they're, they're starting to use it. So we're starting into a whole new world of what we're going to do with these worm castings. We've started mixing the worm castings with the worms into our compost into our raw manure compost to make a verma compost. And so all of that is brand new. It's what we'll be talking about in, you know, in detail in six months. This idea is, is not a new idea, as I'm sure you know. I was just looking behind me and couldn't spot the book. But uh, there's a fascinating little book called uh, Earthworms, the Farmer's Friends. If I have the right book in mind, it's written like in about 1940 or so, and they talk about using earthworms to compost large volumes of dairy manure. It's interesting how uh, we have newer technology and new, new innovative ways of doing this. So what advice would you have? What things have you learned from going through this process? And what advice would you have for other people who want to uh, implement similar systems? Well, worms are amazing. Uh, worms are robust and this system is really really good because one of the things I underestimated from the beginning with worms is they like wet they like to live in wet so we have you know we're constantly making them wet we have we have made them too wet <laughs> and we have killed a lot of worms because we put our green water has been even too too thick we've kind of what we've done is 
you put water in there because before the green water gets to the worms, it's gone through some slope screens. And we found when our slope screens were not working effectively, we actually would create a crust on top of the wood chips or with the wood chips, which would go anaerobic. Uh, this system would go anaerobic. So that was a big learning curve. You can't do that. You, you, have, to, you have to water them more than you kind of estimate, I would guess, which is good for us, but was something that surprised me. Because if there's days where we're shut down for cleaning our slope screen or whatever it might be, you actually get too dry on your beds and it's not good for the worm health. Worm castings are just out of this world. <laughs> I am amazed with the results that we see when we start incorporating this microbial activity worm casting into our soils and the effects that it has is, again, in six months, we'll be able to talk in detail about it. For now, I've been doing it for two years and I'm just like, oh, amazing. That's so cool. But that's about it, the extent of what I can say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you share, you share that with many farmers and let's not remember there's it's so easy for individuals of a scientific bent or individuals who want to discredit something to just say oh well that's just anecdotal evidence but let's not forget the two words of that phrase are anecdotal and evidence it might be <laughs> anecdotal but it is still evidence yeah. and so uh, in in that spirit and in that context i'd really like to uh Tell us a little bit about what have you been observing? What what improvements have you noticed in your soil and your crop performance and perhaps also in your livestock performance since you have been in, begun incorporating both the compost and the vermicompost? Yes, yeah, so we our first kind of uh, experiment with the, I'm going to call it the worm substrate because in this in this example, we didn't screen it. So it had the wood chips and then it had, you know, what, 40% worm castings and then it had still the manure and then what, you know, it had the whole substrate just straight harvested out of the beds. And we put it on a struggling block of apples, a block that never really had a good start, always was the ugly block that we avoided looking at if we had people in the car with us. <laughs> and, and we put it in that block and then that's, that's what we did. We put it, you know, we put about three ton to the acre and... We applied it because I think it was important in my mind and, you know, I'm constantly changing, but we wanted to apply it in the windrow. So at the root zone, because we wanted that ecosystem to that worm to kind of stay intact uh, for the application. We didn't just want to spread it kind of like a compost spreader. So you, you did it right along the trunk line? That's right. So the, the applicator was, you know, it was a side shooter, kind of like a and, you know, and it just put a nice little windrow right along the trunk line. Yep. And that orchard has, has turned a corner. That orchard now is not the ugly block. That orchard makes, you know, it, it looks like the other blocks around it at this point, which doesn't say a lot, but it says a ton because of where it started. How old were these trees when you applied it? Nine years, nine years old. Yeah, so that's one experiment. We've done another experiment with brand new tree, like a, a new planting, and... That orchard, that block is great. They've taken off, and uh, within two years, we almost considered picking. Whereas before, you know, three years is when you pick, sometimes four, but in two years, we just—it's just—it's just again anecdotal evidence. And again, six months from now, hey, we'll have more to talk about. We got a PhD <laughs> on our team now who's going to help us do this, but but it's just—it's really really amazing. And then we can talk about the alfalfa and the tea water, and. And where we put this stuff, it's just our greatest fields are the fields that are tied into our, that are closest to the dairy, that are closest to this uh, worm bed, that are tied into our uh, pipeline for this tea water. So let's talk about the alfalfa fields and the tea water. I think one of the, the immediate first questions, we, we want to talk about the results, but also what else are they getting in addition to the tea water? Are they also getting compost applications? Are they also getting, like, what, what else is, is a part of that success? Yeah, so our every single one of our acres is going to get five tons of compost every single year. Uh, we just that's our base, um, and that's when I say compost, I'm talking compost from our feedlot or from our dairy that we are turning seven times. We certify organic, and, and it's just kind of a that's our baseline, our, our our fundamental, our foundation of our soil. Five acres or five ton per acre every single year, and then beyond that, we've played. Honestly, with the worm castings, we usually save those for the orchard because that's the high dollar. You can't hardly afford 
even if you get 25% more yield in your potatoes, it doesn't hardly pay for the worm castings to get there. So usually we stick to compost and then that tea water comes through the irrigation pivots. Does that answer your question, John? Yeah, let's talk a bit about the performance. Uh, what, what have you seen in the alfalfa fields? And it may be hard to disassociate the compost applications from the tea water, although I guess the tea is more recent. So what shifts have you observed in crop performance with the alfalfa? Yeah, there's 200 acres that comes to mind right next to uh, the worm beds that get the most tea water just by way of proximity. And all of our fields have had compost, so that's pretty baselined. But this field by far gets the most tea water. And it is a, it is a field that we historically have not put potatoes in because it just wasn't good enough dirt. But for the last two years, it, it's been an alfalfa field. The alfalfa is coming out now. The alfalfa has been in there for four years. And for the last two years, we've, been just, we've just been hitting it pretty hard with tea water through the irrigation system. It's, it's not been like an application because it's pretty well clean water. I mean, it's just part of our irrigation system, but it gets a lot. That alfalfa was our highest yielding this year. Last year, we saw it. The year before that, the, the, the previous two years before that, it was our lowest yielding. Again, the soil's bad. It had a, it had a pretty bad stand. We just kind of hit the temperatures wrong. And so it was just kind of a, a limping along alfalfa field. In the last two years since our applications, it ended as our highest yielding alfalfa field. And we got about 4,000 acres to compare against that of alfalfa. So it went from near worst, young, to the best as it got older, which says a lot. Which is the opposite of the usual trend. That's right. Uh, and furthermore, this next year, we're putting potatoes in there, in that dirt. We'll see how it goes, but it's we just have confidence in that dirt now. Whereas before, you know, potato farmers, they got to have a lot of confidence in dirt before they invest in all the money that goes into planting potatoes. These are fascinating stories, but I want to go back to some of the pieces that we started, uh, that you started hinting at at the beginning. Um, what are, I guess I'll begin by asking a very open-ended question is, what are some of the remarkable stories or experiences that stand out in your memory as you've been on this, this transition journey? It's a fun question. It's a good question. You know, there's the, the, one of the stories that comes to mind first, and it was at the genesis of, I will say, our regenerative transition. Not to say, I mean, I want to be careful because my fathers and grandfather, I mean, the farmer in most all cases is the original environmentalist. I mean, soil, health, but as we started to be really intentional in the last 10 years about going regenerative and about reducing our dependency on synthetics, that's, that's what I'm referencing. One of the genesis stories to our transition uh, was another field uh, not too far away from the farm. And it was actually before we bought this dairy farm. So it was when this dairy farm, we were, we were working with it, but it wasn't ours. And the, the previous farmer got into a pickle where he had a whole bunch of green water and, you know, an inspection coming up or whatever. I don't remember the exact scenario, but long story short, we dumped just a ton of shit water on this field to kind of get him out of, to, to help him out, to, to, to work through it. And we, we put a ton and just plowed it in. Long story short, six years after that, this field was the most outstanding field we had. It was our best unit in, in all regards. And we really had no idea why. The only, the only reason, the only difference in this field was just that, that really over application of shit uh, for that one year. And it lasted for about six years. And, and that was really kind of the Genesis story to us saying, you know what? We need to go next level on our manure. This was before we put worms in, but really was, again, kind of the driver to go in that direction and investing in all these systems because we, we realized we don't understand the rhizosphere. In fact, we might know more about the deepest part of the ocean than we know about our rhizosphere. And, <laughs> and somehow... It's saying something, isn't it? It is. And somehow this ruminant manure and the natural regenerative systems that we have come to know more and more about have a huge impact on that on that root zone rhizosphere microbial activity and we want to learn more so that's just that's kind of the story that comes to mind because it it is the genesis of right when i moved back from college like all right we're figuring this out you know austin i think one of the pieces that i find interesting about our conversation 
um, we, we have the privilege of working with many large-scale growers. And so for us, this, this whole idea that regenerative agriculture cannot be large-scale seems kind of laughable because we live it every day. But yet there are people who believe that in order to really be good stewards of the landscape and to truly be regenerative farmers, it requires such intensive management that it doesn't scale and uh, it, it doesn't is not a fit for large scale operations. Can you just reflect on that in your personal experience? What, what has it been like for you in making this transition on the scale that you're operating on? Yeah, I, I love I love that comment and that question because it is such a frustrating dialogue in my mind because regenerative ag and the impact it can have is so incredible. It's so amazing. It's so fun. And to limit it to a small farm, which is just limiting that impact, it seems like such a, such a cop-out. I just, to me, it comes down to a couple of things that allow you to go scale, that allow you to scale it. And, and fortunately, the things correlate very well with large operations. And, and one of those is ruminants. Um, the baseline of having ruminants at a large scale, and may I even say in a CAFO situation in some cases, if you have a very symbiotic relationship with a CAFO, and that's that again kind of acts as your foundation or your basis for this manure and for the growing crops, you know, the cover crops that you are able to really blow the lid off because the cattle don't care, you know, they, they love all grass. And if you want to start the strategy over here for with a six way cocktail, by all means, go for it. Yes, the cattle will, will they'll turn it into something regardless of what you think at the end. So ruminants have allowed us to really, to really do this at scale. Now, the balance to soil and ruminants has to be right. That's where, you know, to, to your point, John, and to the, maybe the argument, there has to be a balance to ruminants and soil. The other kind of topic I go to in my mind when you ask that question is local, a localized system. So it does need to be a localized system. Of course, and I think that's kind of uh, the argument that people are making is a large scale farm isn't localized, but, but I think that's the piece that we need to, to work on. And that's, that's kind of this overarching, we have to be able to grow a lot of these, these pieces local and keep everything in kind of a, a localized system and close that loop in order to do this at scale. That's just where my mind goes when you ask that question, because I think, I think that is the important part, but if we can, if we can, figure those out. If we can figure out how to do it local, then there's no reason why we can't do it at a scale. Yeah. And you know, there's an argument to be made for having more decentralized and regionalized production, as in you're you're in the Columbia River Basin, you're the heart of apple production country for all of North America in that local geography. And and there is an argument to be made that uh, it would be wiser from a climate sensitivity perspective to perhaps not have all of the majority of the apple production so geographically concentrated. But we live in a world where the reality is we, we have come to this situation as a result of economic and market forces. And if we want to have a different situation uh, and want to have different, uh, have regionalized and decentralized production, then there are going to need to be counterbalances to those market forces or different types of market forces that come into play. And some of those are for different crops. But what I really appreciate about the example that you just shared and the work that you're doing is that you are really closing the loop for the waste products of the various processing facilities and and, and the processing that happens. Like that is so important because without that, my understanding is that a great deal of that waste product ends up going into landfills or being plowed back into the soil. It's it's just, it's not, or burned. It's just not utilized. Yep. No, I I agree. And again, that, that goes with like, again, the scaled operation. And even if you will, the CAFO, um, which allows us to do that, which allows us to really gobble up so much of this, garbage which is not at all garbage it's cattle food it's plant food you just it depends how you process it it's worm food but that has been one of our our main i appreciate that john a lot because that's been our main focus and we we have really looked at our waste products starting with the first was the food we can feed the cows our apples our potatoes and it's a massive part of our program we bring those in we're able to bring nutrients in from outside sources 
in order to put those through the, re the great recycler, aka the ruminant, and then reuse that in the soil. So it's a huge part of our program. And then we've jumped into the wood chips, which being in the apple region, and I agree with you, I wish they wouldn't plant as many apples here. My family's culprit to some of it, but very small portion of it. <laughs> keep keep the keep the land diverse. We need some woodstock. We need some real crop. We need some, you know, it's got to be all balanced. But at the end of the day, we still, as of last year, Washington State burned 75% of the retired apple trees because there was no place to put it. You can't even hardly blame the farmer. Hey, farmer, pay $400 more per acre to harvest this, this orchard and then have a pile of wood chips in the corner that will sit there indefinitely and attract mice and disease. And so we now are taking all the wood chips for Washington State and building a market for those. That includes our next level. In six months, we'll be talking about biochar because that's where a portion of those apple trees are going to go to. And and now cardboard, another waste product, compostables. Because we have thousands of ruminants and thousands of ton of raw manure that has the right N, C to N ratio for composting, we are able to make a lot of garbage disappear. Are you saying that you're using cardboard as a feedstock for your composting operation? Yes, we are. We're using it just right now. It's from our, my brother's apple facility, and it's pretty small scale. We, In fact, we use probably 3% of the potential energy that our compost is making naturally because, again, the cow gives us the right C to N ratio. Right. So, yes, we're doing it on a small scale, but we're, we're blowing it up um, here in the next few months as we, again, take the waste products and keep that nutrient in our loop. Yeah keep it going. At the beginning of our conversation, you made mention of improvements that you've observed in fruit qualities, particularly for your apples and potatoes. And one of the things, a decade and a half ago, I used to do a lot of dairy nutrition and was pulling lots of forage samples. And you learn pretty quickly that a ton of alfalfa is not a ton of alfalfa, that there can be very dramatic differences in forage quality that result in uh, significant differences in milk production per ton, even greater than what can be accurately reflected on a test. And so i just love to get your perspective on how has quality evolved of the crops that you're growing as you've made these various changes. I mean, again, the anecdotal evidence is, is huge in my brain and it's blowing up. It's still evidence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we just, you see... For example, on the alfalfa, go into that, go into what you know about alfalfa. I mean, when you feed an alfalfa plant synthetic fertilizers, you can grow really high yielding alfalfa. But when you feed the soil all these microbials and all these nutrients that the soil wants, and you allow the soil to grow that alfalfa crop, then it, it's different. And you notice it in how much leaves are on the I call it the concrete portion, this part of the stem that is not digestible. You have a lot less undigestible stem and you have a lot more leafy greens. Uh, just because the natural, the natural plant wants to grow like that, but when you manipulate it in a sense where you're just feeding that plant N, P, and K or whatever it might be to, to grow, it, it just changes the whole dynamic of that plant. And so... Yeah, alfalfa, just it's leafier, it's higher protein, it's less undigestible uh, fiber. Um, apples. And yeah, with the alfalfa, in my historical experience, when you change the nutrition management, particularly when you start addressing calcium and getting more biological nutrition, there's two significant pieces that happen. One is you really change the leaf to stem ratio, as you pointed out. And the second is that the stem that is there becomes a lot more digestible to the point that you just made about having more digestible fibers. It's it's no longer this hard, woody stem that uh, is really difficult to digest. Yep, I agree. That's been our uh, observations over and over again. So I interrupted you. You were about to begin speaking to the apples? Well, apples, same story. It's just as we, we've, actually, we've actually had to, in some cases, throttle back. You know, we, we've had the experience where we put too much compost and, and our tree becomes too robust and the apples have less of a, a signa, you know, less of a ratio to that tree. So that's where the worm castings have allowed us to really be more effective is because a little less compost, but 
coupled with some worm castings have just have built a healthy tree and have helped the balance within that root zone grow just what we want to grow and that is lots of apples and a healthy tree in effect you're you're able to add more vigorous biology without adding excess of nitrogen or excess of nutrients correct yep more microbial activity to ignite again to wake up that soil to do what that in the tree is going to do naturally if you just let it happen without overdoing it and sometimes that happens with our nitrogen application or our compost application yeah what about the potatoes 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 if if i'm being really honest when i talk regenerative farming and we give a lot of tours there's a lot of interest of regenerative ag at scale um we, we do a lot of this potatoes really are our least regenerative part of our system <laughs> I know what contrarians say, and I know from a contrarian perspective, how can you possibly grow potatoes and aggressively till the soil several times per year and expect that to be regenerative? That's the contrarian perspective, which I don't necessarily agree with for the record. But there's, there's some basis to it, right? You just, when you're growing, this is my opinion, when you're growing a crop for a human, it's going by default to put more pressure on that soil. Because for our digestive system to be able to get nutrients out of it, it has had to to work differently than the grass and the corn that's being grown for a ruminant to digest. And so with our potatoes, we do, and that's why we have a five or six year rotation with them, because it takes us about that long to build that soil back up, to get it to where we want it to be, no tillage during that time. And then we come in and we kind of take the year, we take it in the chops, not to say there's not a benefit there, because in my and you you could speak to this better than me but in my opinion regenerative ag if you had just one minute to talk about it you couldn't talk about the different pillars and you would talk about diversity and the diversity uh, the benefits of diversity and the benefits of that relationship with the root zone and the soil and microbials so potato and growing potatoes like that it is it is an, an added diversity to our rotation, to our programs. And there's benefits to that. But at the end of the day, we are, we're going through there and we are, I mean, we're having to till it just by the fact that you're digging up, you know, 30 tons of potatoes from underneath the dirt. There's no way to do that without tilling the dirt. But I will say it is after that potato year, starting again, uh, starting again, but getting those grasses into it, that's usually the year that we're able to see our grasses take off. They love coming after potatoes. And I just think that's because of the activity, that's because of the diversity there. And of course, we're gonna throw in compost, you know, that compost never stopped. I mean, we're still doing it as regenerative as we can. That's the compost and we're gonna, we're gonna do extra compost for potatoes. And then you plant the grass and, and it really does fit in a nice rotation. Well, you know, there is this common theme in the regenerative agriculture domain where consultants, agronomists, and farmers speak about smelling the soil. They like to go out and dig up soil, and they like to smell it, and, and, and looking for that rich, earthy smell that is a reflection of act actinomycetes activity and, and really abundant microbial populations. And you know, I've smelled lots of soil, and there is no soil that Get, that has that rich, vibrant, earthy smell, the same as soil following a potato crop. Like potatoes are remarkable in their capacity to, to develop that rich, earthy smell. And so, if the assumption is true that there's a correlation between our olfaction, uh, our sense of smell, and microbial activity and diversity, then um, I, I guess I would just ask it as a question. I don't know the answer. I don't have an opinion about this, but I would. I think it's worth asking the question what microbial activity do potato crops add to the soil that we could actually benefit from if we really understood it and knew how to harness it and use it effectively? You know, I'm, I'm underqualified to answer that question. When you start, <laughs> like even some of the words you use for the types of microbials. And the, um, but, you know, something that has really impacted me when it, when it comes to worms is this, this fungus, the fungi, the part of microbial that's in the fungi. The worms are really populating our fungi. And potatoes, they do the same thing. You know, they, they attract certain fungi. In a conventional system, that is very uh, detrimental. I mean, you get, you get, you know, that's why, that's why in potatoes the fun, fungicide is, you know, you use a ton of fungicide in a conventional system. 
So the anecdotal answer there, John, is I think there is just some different fungi that are being attracted on top of that biology. And we do know that there's a balance. The fungi to, the, to, to biological uh, balance is really, really important. And I think potatoes just offer, again, a diversified rotation in our typical you know, cover crop, grass, alfalfa, corn system. You know, sometimes when you're having conversations with people, you just get this flash of inspiration or you get this idea uh, that just pops out of the blue at random. And I just had one of those. Uh, it's just, I'm thinking about the different plant types and what they contribute to soil. And it occurs to me that there are a group of plants which are known to have very positive influences on soil biology. And they are all have very fine roots. Buckwheat, for example, is known to be particularly good at stimulating mycorrhizae and solubilizing phosphorus. It has a very acidic root system. Oats also share that characteristic, and they're both very reducing roots. And what these plants share in common is extremely fine roots. And potatoes have the same. Potatoes have very fine roots, and potatoes also store a lot of their energy below ground in the form of a tuber. So what if there's a possibility that these roots compensate for having limited root biomass by actually sending more root exudates out into the soil profile. It's just a random question that popped into my mind, and I don't know the answer. I don't expect you to either, but wanted to share that. It makes sense. I think it's brilliant. I think it's exactly why, again, I, I love regenerative ag. It's because it's not defined. It's not totally in a box, which is what I would argue that USD Organic has done is it's put us in this box to say, get up to this line and then do everything you can to get to this line. And if you cheat, it doesn't matter as long as you get to this line. And it just, I think it's, it's, the, wrong, it's the wrong idea. But with regenerative ag, I mean, there's all these different concepts that I think make it work. And yeah, I love it. Yeah. So you've, you've developed a, uh, a very different perspective and a different farming operation there in the local context. What do you believe to be true about farming and about agriculture that is different from the mainstream view, that is different from the view of others in your community? So it's all long-term. Everything's a long-term strategy. And agriculture and our family farm and a lot of family farms, we never sit around the dinner table and talk about our EBITDA and about our, our sellout strategy, right? Like, I don't know, just what my buddies talk about when they're in the worlds they're in of Wall Street. It's just, that's not a, that's not a perspective. We have no short-term play. In fact, we're gonna lose money many years, but, but we're living our dream and we're gonna have something for our kids if they want to, to grow up on. And so I think, I think that really fits well with regenerative agriculture because everything we do is long-term and everything we do is to make our soil fundamentally healthy for generations to come. I agree with most of what you said, except the losing money part. I, I don't know how you equate losing money with regeneration. Those seem to be mutually exclusive. Well, I mean, I only say that this year because the milk price has kicked my butt, but we may, we've made <laughs> money in the system, but sometimes the markets still come to you and just surprise you with something you cannot control. Yeah. <laughs> You know, farming at the scale you are, um, one of the, I guess you are organically certified, so that somewhat has the effect of decommoditizing you, but uh, are removing you from the commodity supply chains. But one of the challenges that I see sometimes is that farmers make a transition to regenerative agriculture and their farming operation itself is simply incredible. Their improvements in soil health and the, and the crop performance they've been able to produce are, they're remarkable stories. And they have the data and the evidence to back that up. And yet they still sell into commodity supply chains. And as a result, the financial ability is not there. The, the, the financial reward is not there for all the work that they've done historically. How have you thought about that and how have you managed that for your operation? It's a great question. So we, most of what we do is not certified organic. Okay. All of our compost, a lot of our fruit is. But most of our potatoes, on occasion, we go but most of it's not certified organic so so we very much have been in the middle of that world trying to figure out how we how we benefit from these practices outside of just having better soil having better crops reducing our need for synthetic fertilizers and it started most of that conversation goes towards our beef program 
So our beef program, we've started direct to consumer at a real large scale. So the Seahawks and the, the Climate Pledge Arena and a lot of these big time customers in Seattle and a lot of customers, they're looking for these programs. But if they're being honest with themselves, they're looking for these programs at a massive scale that can still support the needs that they're used to, the consistency and everything else. So our beef program, our Royal Ranch label has really, really taken off. And it's allowed us to translate that label because, again, our biggest emphasis is diversity. When we sell beef, we make sure everyone understands the only reason we can do this regeneratively is because we have the acres and we have the woodstock and we have the worms that all work symbiotically. And so that's a big part of our story. So it's really worked in nicely to labeling now our fruit with some of these storytelling pieces to the point where now almost all of our products beef and fruit, our, our milk's not there yet, but it will be. It has a QR code and that QR code is blockchain and it has the whole life cycle of that product on that QR code on that blockchain and it takes you to the site, which tells you the, the animal's birthday, it tells you what it ate, it tells you what USDA Comet Farm says its carbon footprint is based on all of its ins and outs and everything. And it tells you what, who its sire was. It tells you all that data about that animal, which is allowing us to tell the story about regenerative practices, diversity, and how that all works together and try to capture some of that. I think that's such an important piece. And you're obviously doing that and doing that well and seeing success with that. What, given the, the personal experience you have on your operation and also the conversations you have with, with other farmers, I'm, I'm sure you're perceived as a leader in, in the farming community locally. What do you believe most limits farmers from achieving the potential that they're really capable of and from taking some of these next steps? Collaboration. Aha, uh -huh. bingo. I agree with you 100%. Yeah, I think that's where I'm just really fortunate that my brother and my brother and my dad and my uncle and my cousin, we eat dinner together, we see each other all the time, and it allows us to collaborate. Because what I'm doing, I mean, I can't take credit for all of it. I mean, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the cattle side, but the collaboration to the woodstock, to the real crop, to the grass, to the cattle, to the worms, all of that system is what is what makes it work. And so when a farmer has his focus on the monocropping or whatever he might be doing, then it'll never work. They have to have, and it's okay, you can stay focused on on whatever you're doing, but you have to have the integration with the cattle farmer and the integration with the woodstock or whatever it might be. There has to be that integration. And so I think that's the biggest barrier to entry and why I'm in a fortunate spot because they just happen to be my brothers and cousins. Yeah, I I really resonate with your answer because I see collaboration in, in two ways. One is the, the very tangible collaboration of of synergizing livestock and land and different crop types and different types of resources. But then there's also the collaboration of information. And it's been intriguing to me to observe, occasionally farmers have made significant progress on their own pathway and have achieved a fairly high degree of success and then been unwilling to share the the pathway to success with others, that they wanted this to be their, their unfair advantage in the marketplace. And you know what has been interesting? Have, having been in this space now for 15 years, it's been interesting to see how many of the people who have had that perspective, who've been unwilling to share, who then did not continue their farming operation in the long term for any number of different reasons. It's just looking at this from a kind of a cosmic perspective, it, it merely makes you ask the question is like what there was such a strong self-interest there and somehow that self-interest got sabotaged. I'm a God-fearing man. One of the, the, the scriptures in the Bible that resonates with me more than anything is you, you find yourself, you lose yourself, you lose yourself, you find yourself. And I think that's, to me, that's what you're saying is you will lose yourself if, if you're not collaborating, if you're not open, if you're not losing yourself just a little bit and trying to help others. And I think, I think that's a powerful force in this world. I think there's a, there's a lot of blessings, if you will, that come from somebody who's willing to collaborate and, and look outward. And when you start looking inward, it just don't work for a lot of reasons. A different way of saying that is when you are selfish, then uh, you can expect the people around you to treat you in the same way. So, 
Austin, this has been such a wonderful conversation. I've really enjoyed it. I've learned lots of things, particularly about worm farming, amongst other things. And uh, my my hope for you is that uh, other farmers reach out to you and you're able to both expand what you're doing, but also uh, share the information about worm farming to other people as well. So thank you for being here and thank you for sharing. Thanks for having me, John. It's been fun. I hope you uh, make a trip out to the Columbia Basin. Come check it out. I will at some point, for certain. The team at AEA and I are dedicated to bringing this show to you because we believe that knowledge and information is the foundation of successful regenerative systems. At AEA, we believe that growing better quality food and making more money from your crops is possible. And since 2006, we've worked with leading professional growers to help them do just that. At AEA, we don't guess, we test, we analyze and we provide recommendations based on scientific data, knowledge, and experience. We've developed products that are uniquely positioned to help growers make more money with regenerative agriculture. If you are a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, someone who believes in a better, more regenerative way to grow, visit advancingecoag.com and contact us to see if AEA is right for you. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to working with you.